Tathagatasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Buddhang Dhammang Sanghang Namasahami Good to see everybody here. Um, as Ajahn Nisibo mentioned last week, uh, he gave a talk on Asuba. So that is the recollection or meditation, paying attention to the unbeautiful parts of the body. Um, and this is a really helpful recollection when lust or some kind of deep craving arises, being able to yeah, see that which is not beautiful about something, specifically that which is not beautiful about the body. And in the talk, Ajahn Nisibo mentioned imagining hair and soup and flaky dead skin and uh, crushing bones in your mind. And oil. In, oil too. in oil? oil yeah. Too. Oily, yeah, oily skin. And uh, imagining peeling off someone else's eyelids. <laughs> so uh, I think you can virtually rely on that if we give a talk where we encourage you to imagine peeling off someone's eyelids, then within three to five weeks, we'll give a talk on loving kindness just to, to balance things out. So, uh, yeah, so we did that chant on loving kindness, and uh, I'd actually love it if we could chant um, the very next page. So on page 43, this is the suffusion of the divine abidings. And these are the two main ways that people are taught in America to practice loving kindness, either with the phrases, may I abide in well-being and freedom from affliction, and freedom from hostility. We've got five or six phrases that you memorize and you kind of say that in your mind and um, that's one way. And then we've got this way here, which is a more uh, pervading sense of, of metta. And we'll just do the first paragraph, the one on loving kindness. So. Now let us make the four boundless qualities shine forth. I will abide pervading one quarter with a heart imbued with loving kindness. Likewise the second, likewise the third, likewise the fourth. So above and below, around and everywhere, and to all as to myself. I will abide pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with loving kindness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. So it's got a, a different flavor to it. And today I'd really like to go in depth into this per particular pericope. So this is a fancy word. I only learned it two years ago. Um, you find it in scriptural study. Um, it is a stock phrase. So the Pali Canon, the main scriptures of Theravada Buddhism, uh, are filled with these pericopes, these stock phrases where uh, the Buddha will say something here, and it's like a puzzle piece, and he uses the puzzle piece in this puzzle, in this discourse, and then he uses it in a different collection, and uh, it's really, it allows for ease of memory. It's not that the Buddha was uh, totally fixated on always being completely spontaneous. Um, he could have these formulas, which are great for memory, and when you're coming to meditate, uh, it can be quite helpful to have these Spe specific phrases which you say in your mind. Some people talk about um, metta or the whole Dhamma as being a science. So you found this kind of language a lot in the 1960s, 1970s, especially when Theravada Buddhism was coming to uh, the West, coming to America, and you had teachers in uh, Sri Lanka or India kind of translating these concepts for the West and making them more uh, 
accessible for a Western mind, and it seemed there was a, a thought, which is probably true, that framing things in this scientific framework will make them, you know, this isn't, we're not pushing a religion, this is just science. So you get a very clear formula like this. I will abide in well-being, in freedom from affliction, in freedom from hostility, in freedom from ill will. You memorize the sayings, and you do it with yourself, and then you're taught to do it with someone, say these thoughts with regards to someone who you love and who it's easy to have these thoughts with. May they abide in well-being and freedom from affliction and freedom from hostility and freedom from ill will. And somebody who you're neutral about, like the you know, person at the, the grocery store who you don't know very well, and then maybe even an enemy. Or you can do it your family, in your community, in your city, in your state. And it's very systematic in this way, very scientific. But metta and the whole Dhamma really is also, it's an art. It's an art as well as being a, a science and knowing what you need uh, at any particular time. Sometimes you might lead, need to lean into the specific formulas, memorizing these things and bringing them up. It's a very specific method. It's not woolly. It's very clear and specific. And sometimes you you just might need to chillax and uh, yeah, go to the beach with your meditation and um, open things up and realize that meditation can be an art as well. Um, so before going into the specifics of this, uh, this pericu particular pericope, um, really going into each of the words, and we will be referring to the Pali, and this is a, a very traditional way of analyzing or speaking about or thinking about living a sutta is just this way. You take a discourse that the Buddha gave or a short passage, and then you elaborate on it. There's cases in the Pali Canon. These, there's four different discourses about one excellent night in the middle-length discourses, which are all three different monks giving their own takes on one short passage, short poem by the Buddha. And then traditional uh, exegetes, commentators, we do the same thing. You take a passage and then you define each word and you go back and forth like this. So before doing that, which isn't very appealing for some people um, to be so somewhat rigid, um, we do a little bit of a psychological test. And don't be afraid, we won't sell your information to Google. But here it is, and this can work either way, whether up or down. So looking at these two shapes, which one is boba and which one is kiki? <laughs> which one is boba and which one is kiki? Okay. So, how do I ask this? Uh, which one, who thinks that this one is boba? Show of hands, okay? And who thinks that this one is boba? Okay, no, no wrong answers, no wrong answers. Totally cool, this one can be boba. Um, but this test was first done, it's actually got a name, it's called the boba, boba kiki effect. B-O-U-B-A-K-I-K-I -K -I effect. And you can read about it on Wikipedia, you can read about the original studies. The original study is done in 1920s, and then you had a researcher in 1921 who came up with the particular names. Um, Ramachandran was the researcher's name, and done with both American college students and Tamil speakers in India. And 95 to 97% of people did the same as 97% of you, which was this guy's boba, the kind of bubbly, boba tea looking, boba fett looking, blobby one over here. And this one is, is Kiki. And no offense, you know, I, I think I, do, I did know somebody named Kiki once. And it's, there's nothing against Kiki. Um, but it does point, and this is, this test, these, this effect has been, um, it's been tested multiple times. It works with uh, people who are uh, blind, have been blind since birth. It shows the same effect, people feeling the different shapes. They say that the pointy one is Kiki, generally, and the round one is Boba. And with children, even age two, show the same effects. So, and cross-culturally, so it's, um, yeah, it's been reduplicated and um, done many times in different settings. And it points to something called ideasthesia or sound symbolism, that there is some kind of deep relationship to sounds or ideas and, and shapes and different 
uh, angularity or lack of it. And I bring it up here because uh, I'd like to ask all of us, what shape is your meta? What shape is your, is your meta? And yeah, this, the way that I'm gonna be analyzing this discourse might seem a little bit kiki. You know, it's not super spontaneous. It's not uh, totally um, off the cuff. We keep referring back to the sutta again and again and going back. And um, yeah, that's one way of analyzing things. And it's good to be able to have the, the flexibility um, to appreciate or at least hear both sides of things. Um, I was uh, listening to a, I've got a program which will read text to me off of a screen, and I was listening to a, uh, a book by uh, Tsokni Rinpoche. Uh, he's written a book called Carefree Dignity, which is so good, so good, everybody. I highly recommend that. Just the words are great, just the title. Um, but this passage, I was listening to it, and there must have been something with the font, but every time the computer voice would come to, he would talk about, he would come to a particular part, and he would talk about uh, sp spontankerous wisdom, spontankerous insight. And I was like, what is spontankerous insight, spontankerous uh, wisdom? And obviously, it was, it was spontaneous. Uh, it was spontaneous, and, uh, but I just love that word, spontankerous. Like, it's a, it's a combination of spontaneity and being cantankerous or being just edgy. You just don't like uh, certain things. And you definitely encounter this in a monastery. In America, where people are coming from a Zen background, where there's very little formal instruction and extreme emphasis on spontaneity, on, um, yeah, just asking somebody what an orange is, um, versus Theravada, which is very much the system of the, the elders, it's, it's got a lot of traditional aspects to it. So you see this spontankerousness where you get kind of edgy and cantankerous about spontaneity and um, you always want everything to be spontaneous. Um, but at risk of triggering those people, um, just go into uh, some of this in the Pali and in the English because the English uh, has a lot of insights and um, it's the way that many people have been taught and learned how to, to meditate. Um, but when you look back at the Pali, it really suggests other ways, other very profound ways, um, shifts of practicing metta. So just the very first clause, I will abide pervading one quarter with a heart imbued with loving kindness. So to start off with, it's good to note that in the Pali, the first word is not I. The first word is metta. And actually, in the Pali, there is no I. There is no I in the Pali. Sometimes there's an I. There, there are pronouns in Pali. But here, the verb contains the pronoun. And here, it's not even a first-person pronoun. It's a third-person pronoun. So it would be better translated as one abides pervading one quarter. So, and what is that one? Is that, I, on one level, it just undercuts the eye of the whole process. It's so easy to get into this eyeing, this meing of my meta. It's like Cyclops meta, like Cyclops, like from the X-Men, not from the, uh, the Odyssey. But you're just like shooting the laser beams of just meta, boom, with a, with a kind face. Um, but the poly, there's, there's, no, there's no eye, and the pronoun doesn't even come first. So we foreground, this is meta, meta doing meta. So I will abide pervading one quarter. Um, something else here is the ordering of the verbs here. I will abide pervading. So you could take this, and I certainly have, is that this is what I'm supposed to do with meta. It's like, it's like you're in your fallout shelter after the apocalypse and you've got your flashlight, your crank flashlight and your crank radio. And it's like you're, I'm constantly abiding, pervading. I'm like constantly having to crank up my meta. It's like I'm abiding while having to keep on, keep on doing it. Whereas the poly, the verbs are ordered the other way around. So it is one having pervaded, one abides. 
So having pervaded, one abides. And that's, that's fascinating. That's very different. It's very different. It's very different because you're dwelling in the abiding. You're not dwelling in the cranking. You're not dwelling in the cranking out and the producing of all this love and just saying, okay. <laughs> I had one uh, very good monk friend. He's still a monk. He uh, used to be a soldier, and his way of, he had a lot of samadhi, a lot of concentration, and he could just sit down for hours and um, just sit like a rock. Um, he actually got a hernia, or a, no, appendicitis. He was sitting meditation, and his appendix broke, and uh, he just kept sitting with it and ended up having to go to the hospital. Not, not recommending that, but um, he, he had good samadhi, very good uh, concentration. Um, it's good to also have... Yeah, awareness of our appendices. Um, <laughs> but his way of practicing metta, he described it to me one time. It's like his way, he would just go through, so living in a monastery, basically most of the time we just see all the other monks. That's the main people who we see. And it's very easy, the ordering of us monks, we just go by when we ordained. So there's a line, and it's just seniority. So he would go down in his imagination, the line of the monks. So the abbot, you go like, in his mind, metta and the vice abbot, meta, and the next abbot, meta, and you just go down the line, like meta, 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 and then some monk who we didn't really like would come up and he'd be like, don't really like that guy, doesn't matter, meta, meta, Met, don't like that, uh, meta, doesn't matter, meta, and he was just, you know, like a meta, like shotgun. Um, and that's, we don't have to do that, you know, it's a, uh, having pervaded a gerund, so it's almost, um, it's a present past tense. So having pervaded one, in one step, we will, as you see here, it says one quarter, the second quarter, the third quarter, the fourth quarter. But you can just pop the bubble from the beginning. Having pervaded, just done. The mind is already expansive from the beginning. Consciousness already knows from the beginning is a very useful word in, uh, in English. It's called sensorium. So this is the sum total of all of our senses. So the sensorium includes all of the light data, all the visual data that we're getting from the outside world. It includes all the sounds that we're hearing near and far. It includes all the odors and all the tastes and all the touches that we're taking in, all the feelings of the body and everything that's coming up in the mind. This is the sensorium. And even if we don't know it, we're still feeling the whole body. If someone were to come up to some part of my body that I'm not actively paying attention to right now and poke me in that part of the body, I would know it, like right away. Um, don't do it. Um, but yeah, the mind consciousness is, yeah, there is this immediacy of spacious, three-dimensional, sensorial, sensorium awareness. And so you can pervade all quarters from the very beginning. You can just let down all the curtains in every direction from the beginning. So that's having pervaded. The next line, or the next word in the Pali is sahagatena. So this is paired, it's literally, it's a compound word which you find a lot in the Pali, um, with metta, with loving kindness, or loving friendliness. The, the word metta is usually translated as loving kindness. Excuse me. This started being used because there were early translators in the, into English from the Pali in the late 1800s who were very familiar. They were translating in a very Baroque, very Victorian way with lots of thou's and shouts and they were very familiar with the King James Bible and this word loving kindness which is not a word you find outside of Buddhist circles in America is found like 50 or 70 times in Ecclesiastes or Psalms um, so it's in the King James Bible a lot hyphenated meta or loving kindness but you can also translate it loving friendliness you can just translate it love if that's not uh, triggering for you um, I think it's the, I'm not sure, Greek or Latin, but agape is the same concept from the, the biblical concept of just loving kindness for, towards all beings right now. Um, 
So however you translate it, this hagata is right up next to, it's the same word as metta. And we translate it here is with a heart imbued, whereas sahagata, it literally means like going with or walking with. So it's like you can imagine just walking, you know, hands in hand, hand in hands with loving kindness, with your heart, with some friendliness. It's just super chill and nobody's going to make fun of you for holding friends, holding hands with your good friend, loving kindness, and just a comfortable, a comfortable dwelling, just walking along with metta, the mind, the chetas, can be translated as, in some of these translating, translated, translated chanting books, it's heart, sometimes it's mind. And it's honestly, at a monastery, you'll hear it both ways, and I often forget which one it, it is in the book, because it can mean, it can be translated as both heart and mind. And oftentimes that heart center, the physical heart center uh, can be, it is associated more with uh, this emotional center and with this softness and with this in touchness with the, the soft side of our, our beings. Um, so the heart is great, the Pali word. Sometimes the Abhidhamma uh, Buddhist philosophy will actually say, where does the mind abide? And what they say is the hridya vatu, the hadya vatu, the base of the physical heart. And uh, I don't think that's backed up in other suttas, but um, yeah, because you could very much say there's no center to this knowing. There's no center to the mind. There's no center and there's no, it's like a circle that has a center everywhere and a circumference nowhere, but heart center, it's good enough. So having pervaded the heart or mind, having pervaded one quarter with a mind imbued with loving kindness or loving friendliness, one abides. One just, you just chill out and you can relax your shoulders and, and if uh, wherever you are, it is just this relaxing and especially in conversation, just as we were saying in the meditation, paying attention to these orbicularis oculi, these muscles around the eyes, because so much, you won't even notice that you're attaching to a particular idea or view or conceit that that person doesn't know what they're talking about, or I'm right and they're wrong. This is right and everything else is wrong. And that's what's going on deep in the, the chatter, but the eyes have already started to clamp shut and uh, I could see it sometimes when I'm, you know, talking Buddhism. I haven't tried to talk Buddhism very much with my family in about 10 years or so because uh, they just don't like it. It's like you can see the, the veils, the windows up there. It's more than the veils. It's the whole vin window just shuts. You start talking Buddhism and it's like, and yeah, there's no more opening. So um, yeah, we can relax the eyes and relax our, our whole being. Um, this word paritva, parati, puto, it comes up uh, in this sutta. It also comes up in the description of the different similes for the jhanas, the meditative absorptions. So when the Buddha talks about the first jhana, it's as if a bathman or a bathman's apprentice, so we don't usually have bathhouses these days, but like a sauna or a sauna person apprentice, it's like they take a bath ball, so like a ball of bath powder, and they knead water into it they drench, steep, fill, and pervade that ball just enough so it's not oozing, but it's just totally filled with water. That word there for drenching and pervading the ball is parati, uh, puto. So that's the simile for the first jhana. So we're making the whole body mudu. We're making the whole body soft. This is a characteristic that uh, Abhidhamma says, is involved in any wholesome mind state. There's an aspect of both softness, mudu, and kamaniya, workability. There's this level of workability. It's like the inner Play-Doh is like, it's not all crunchy and, you know, you know when you would get your Play-Doh and it was all like crunchy. It's not like that. Um, it's all totally, totally soft. And um, so it's there in that first jhana simile. It's there in the second jhana simile. 
So these meditative absorptions, deep samadhi, just as if there were a lotus pond. Is that the second or third, Jonah? Second, third, okay. So just as a big pond of water who had a fountain coming up from the bottom. Yeah, so yeah, the second jhana, just as if there was a, a pond and it had a inflow from the bottom, a stream coming up, and there were no out inlets from streams on any side, and it wouldn't be rained upon. It just got this cool stream coming up from the bottom. So too, one drenches, steeps, fills, and then pervades the mind with this sense of rapture and pleasure, this sense of kind joy or... Uh, soft friendliness, joy, and happiness, sukha. The third jhana, just as a three different color lotuses, green or blue or yellow, floating submerged in water, totally submerged with all of their roots and all of their leaves fully submerged, so too one abides in this deep meditative absorption. And what you see in all these beautiful similes using the same word of pervading is it's not that we're shooting the water, we're not shooting the metta out at anybody. Uh, if anything, it's the water's coming from out, outside. Or once the water has come in, this namjai, this is a beautiful Pali word, or Thai word, it literally means the waters of the heart. Uh, and it just, it means generosity, but it's just a great simile. And we just bring these waters of the heart um, in an instant, yeah, just pervading. And whether that happens from out to end, in, or in to out, or both inside to outside, outside to inside, it can happen every way. And uh, see about that, that phrase, which I didn't make up, of explore. Is the mind inside of the head, or is the head inside of the mind? Is the heart inside of the body or is the body inside of the heart? And looking at that, you might say, uh, are you trying to say that, uh, yeah, that I'm not making any kind of ontological claim about uh, the nature of reality that, um, yeah, that mind is in, in body or body, uh, just feel it. Just feel the question, uh, where is, yeah, how far, how limited or how expansive can the mind be? How limited or how expansive can the mind be? Right now, okay, my body stops here. I can't see it, but it's purportedly probably all of you can. All of you are in my awareness. I can feel above my head. I can feel metta for Matt. I can feel metta for my mom. She's not here right now. Mom, if you're ever in Seattle, stop on by. Uh, it's not totally Buddhist all the time here. So, um, so yeah, our metta, our minds are bigger than the body. Or just put that question to yourself. And yeah, feeling, 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 feeling your face, feeling your body. Um, and what is your, what does your metta feel like? Is it, is it kiki? Or is it, is it boba? Can you soften into things? Are you feeling a little bit edgy and a little bit pointed? Or your arguments or the next thing that you want to say to your friend or your wife or your husband or your child? Is it pointed? Do you have ready the next thing that you're going to, you know, knock them out with? Or is there more circularity and more spaciousness and roundness to it? So the moral of today's Dhamma talk, and I'll put it up. I've got it written down. Not spontaneous, but if you're feeling a little bit kiki, if you're feeling a little bit kiki, let your meta be boba. <laughs> we'll leave that up here too. And that's the end of the talk. Handa mayam damakataya sadhu karam damase sadhu 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 anumodami.
Okay, so um, we got time for about 10 minutes of, of questions. If people on Zoom, if you have a question, you can raise your uh, cartoon hand, and if you have a question here, you can raise your real hand, and we've got a mic runner to bring a, a mic to you so everyone can hear. And I can't see your name, but on Zoom. Gudas, please. Second, Gudas. Also, if people need to stand and move around, you can. Goodis, you should be able to speak now. Did it go? I think you're still muted, though. Yes, now it oh, is. Oh, we can allowing, hear you now. Go for it. it now it is allowing to unmute Bande. Uh, last time also, I thought to speak, but uh, the time was less. Uh, even the last time, uh, Dhamma talk was also excellent. And uh, I'm seeing the Clear Mountain Monastery is growing day by day. It indicates the Dhamma is growing. May this Dhamma propagate in everyone's life and may all beings be happy. Thanking you, Bhante. I think we can get three sadhus for that. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Goodest, where are you, by the way? I am from India, nearby Hyderabad city. Okay, it's great to have you join us. Thank you. Yes, I'm happy to join this uh, monastery. Monastery's Zoom meeting. That was a good lead-in. So we have time for questions in the afterglow. I uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I feel like with the reordering of the verbs when you were talking about the poly, I feel like that's a pretty significant paradigm shift, at least for me and in my experience of, I guess, how I was, how I'd taken that before. Um, would you say that, um, would one be able to make a broad stroke of, for other places in English translations where it seems like this kind of active, like, um, kind of, uh, like from this active to this kind of, like, I guess passive, to, um, would you say generally one could kind of take that approach? Or do you think that could be the case in cultivation? I think it, I think it depends on the context. There are definitely places where the Buddha does uh, say that there is a place for being quite active. Um, yeah, he says if certain types of thoughts come up of like ill will or cruelty of like hyper sensuality of sensuality come up, that there is a place for yeah, really cutting those off um, rather actively, depending on you know, how dangerous the implications of you know, an action resulting from that might be. But in general, yeah, it's good to experiment with, <laughs> because underlying the question, there is passive, there is active voice in Pali. In Pali, there's always the underlying assumption of not self. So whether it's active voice, first person, I will abide, or passive voice, there is the abiding, um, third person, passive. Even if it's first person passive, or first person active, it's, they're still not self. So experimenting with the language for yourself, and for me, I also find it a big paradigm shift um, to shift those around and to play around with the active, because honestly, we're so active and we're so controlly, many of us. Certainly, I can speak for myself, like trying to control the world around me, trying to control my own mind, and uh, there is a huge opening in space for practices where you don't do that, where you really do allow for a listening approach versus a broadcasting approach. Thanks, Trin. I want to say thank you for the talk and maybe just to share a, a, a reflection on it and just ask for any feedback. Um, uh, I think my first experience with Meta was very directed at a very difficult family situation and I used it just putting a lot of effort into it and it was good because it took the focus away from myself. So that was my, but recently you, this talk articulated something that's come in me which is um, less effortful and my mental image is of like 
water going through a paper towel. It kind of goes by itself, and it's been nice to be able to kind of rest and have kind of as many or more units of meta with less effort. So. <laughs> units of meta per e unit of effort. That's awesome. I love that. Um, Beautiful, great simile. Just like water inches its way by itself through paper. That's quite beautiful. Yeah, thanks. It's a very kiki analogy. <laughs> Units of effort. Um, I, I will say that, like, one of the. Um, I, I really appreciate Ajin Covelo bringing to mind, like, the. The met to moving in almost, and that sense of pervading. And I think the place you're pointing to is really important, too. In, in, Meta's very, um, it's tricky because there is really a, a drive to like, you know, shoot the meta out of your, your eyes kind of, you know, and often there's this humility with the four, four noble truths of just often the right place for meta is yourself. Like so often when we're angry, you want to spread meta to the person you're averse towards. And very often the correct orientation of meta is just the sense of like, it really hurts to be angry. This, this really is painful. And just that sense of, it's a much more humble, less active approach, but often we like skip over or jump over the pl one place that really needs that metta. And it's, so I really appreciate that, that sense of gentling you talked about. And tell me your name again. Brandon, thank you, sorry. All right, hello? Okay, so um, about like seven or eight weeks ago, went to a restaurant and I was just like super bored and the hostess asked me, how are you? And I lied, I said I, I was good. Um, and you know, that made me, you know, kind of think back about this one sutta about um, if you lie, you know, um, your, spiritual, your spiritual progress has kind of been de depleted or, to, or whatever. Um, and I was just wondering, how does one like completely eradicate just speaking untruths? Because um, my solution to that in retrospect was, instead of answering good, I could have said like, um, you know, I'm grateful that I have two fully functioning legs or something, you know? <laughs> something like honest, genuine, sincere. And I was just wondering, like, because in that moment, um, I just felt bad after I said good when I wasn't. And I was just wondering like, how does one completely like just remove like this, this, you know, this lying psyche out of my mind? Thank you. Yeah, you can do it all at once or, and gradually. So it's like any time that it, the opportunity comes up to lie, you can just not do it and that's a victory. And just getting into the habit, that's how you, you do it. And, Reflecting back, thinking back about that sense of, oh, that didn't feel good to lie, and also a strategy of what you might say next time. And that leaning into gratitude, that's such a great solution because hopefully, like no matter how, however we feel, there are things that we can be grateful for. So answering in that way, I think, is a really skillful solution. And it just, yeah, not lying is a habit that comes over time. And we do confess it. It's the first one of the confession rules of 92 rules that involve con confession for a monk. It's the first one. So if you tell an intentional lie, there is a non-offense clause if you just speak quickly. So this one, you know, it's kind of on the border. Like it was just, it's a habit. Like it's what you do in America. Somebody asks you how you are and you're like, I'm, do I'm cool, I'm cool, okay? Um, but yeah, you know, just when you start to realize and value truth, then you don't want to do that anymore. So um, you're yeah, not beating yourself up at all, but thinking of skillful means to kind of create the better habit because you do, the more you tell the truth, then the more you'll create a society around you of people that tell truth, uh, the truth and you just look around one day and everybody around you is just beautiful. Yeah. And even if they're not beautiful, you know, uh, we can still be kind, so. Yeah, I appreciate you bringing this up. And the sutta you're referencing of one being devoid of spiritual merit if they lie, it's the Buddha with his son, Rahula, and he says, one who feels no shame in telling an intentional lie is devoid of kind of, you know, 
that's the issue, no shame. Because, um, yeah, it's a practice, and these are, the five precepts are training rules, training grounds. We're training ourselves with them, and we're going to slip up. Um, and, and that's just part of the, the thing, is like messing up and then refining. And this is a very small mess up, but it is, you know, the word is kusala, which means um, skillfulness. And learning how to hold the precepts is an applied skill. Like, how do you answer that question? How are you? The Dhamma is well expounded by the Blessed One, apparent here and now. Great. <laughs> how are you? The five khandas are arising and falling. You know, I've heard all those. Um, or I'm okay, you know, I'm grateful. Um, and so, so it, it takes a certain, you know, it, it's, you do want to prepare for certain questions. And to hold this well, when you approach a difficult conversation where you know you shouldn't be completely say everything on your mind, you will have to kind of prepare, like, how am I going to respond to this question in a way that won't cause damage, but will keep my, keep my sila. Um, but if you can keep that honesty, it will change your life. I mean, it is, we were interviewing Gil Fronsdale, and he talked about going to a commune, and they'd had to give up their sacrament of LSD because they kept getting arrested, and they were looking for a sacrament as powerful for their commune of 700 people as LSD. And the thing they came up with was honesty and just holding that with utmost integrity. And I've seen it in this community, like people take on that fourth precept of not lying and their whole life suddenly shifts and vast changes happen, but it takes, it takes guts too. So yeah, Anamotana for that. And yeah, that's a pretty minor one, so I wouldn't worry too much, but. Yeah, so we'll actually have to wrap up a little early today because we have a special um, kind of premiere. Um, so Jen, uh, would you mind coming up and we'll get a seat for you and maybe we could pull this camera back to get her in frame. Uh, if you're joining on YouTube, we're going to be moving to Zoom for this and stopping the YouTube live stream for this video premiere. So if you're joining on YouTube, um, You'll find a link to the Zoom maybe in the chat and in the description. And so either you'll see this video uh, go public on the channel on Tuesday, so you're welcome to see it then. But if you want the sneak preview, then just jump on Zoom right now and uh, you'll be able to watch there. Um, but otherwise, goodbye, YouTubers. See you soon. Um, and see, Joseph, you're still on Zoom, so we get you with the heart. So that's, that's good. Um, so. Basically, um, we can do the blessing braid at the end, yeah? Yeah, do you think no? Or let's do it. Yeah, we'll, we'll actually do some of the other stuff first. So, Jen, you're cool sitting there for a second? Okay, so first of all, we'll just um, quickly uh, do the, the chanting request. Um, so, Cheryl, would you read out those who have listed their names for today? These are people we can just hold in our hearts for the moment. Right, give me one second here. I got to open the page. Plus, I have lots of things set up in here. <laughs> Chanting press. Here we go. Okay. Um, Sally Cantu for a positive rebirth passed away today six years ago. Sherry Garman passed on this week over 10 years ago, spread love for safe passage and the peace of her family. To all beings, including devas and nagas, wishing all happiness and peace. Jen with cancer, spread metta for healing and letting go. Swarnalata, got heart blockages, got stunts, spread happiness, wishing for sooner recovery. Ar Arjun Ladwe, got hand surgery, second time, spread happiness and peace. Gudas Suresh Sunita Savan Kumars Neha Samvega Sindhu, spread happiness and peace. Marilyn, for ease and well-being, admitted to hospital yesterday for stroke assessment. Do others have some names they'd like to bring to mind for the moment? Ed died of pancreatic cancer. That's great. Maggie, undergoing chemo. Maggie, undergoing chemo. 